I would like to introduce Cam again, who will be presenting the proper way to prepare for a network engineering job interview with a tech giant. Cam is a member of the program committee and a director of cloud engineering at Oracle. Having traveled from California to join us on stage today, this is Cam's sixth, present, sixth time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have you, have you back on stage again. Welcome back, Cam. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> cool. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, welcome to Nanog. 88. Seems like I'm between you and the end of the day. Everybody wants to go back home. This is not the best time, but I promise this is going to be an interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Cam, as I was introduced, and I'm Director of Cloud Engineering with Oracle. My teams are responsible for anything network engineering related to the cloud. Today, I'm here presenting an interesting session, how to prepare for a network engineering, especially when you're talking to a tech giant, let's say top 10 companies in the world. Let's get started and have a look at a little background here. Once, uh, back in 2019, I presented a session uh, on some boring network, engin uh, network engineering interview questions. You can find this session on YouTube. Actually, I do recommend you go ahead and have a look at that session. One of the popular sessions, it's got uh, thousands of views so far, and still three years later, people do reach out with questions and feedback, mostly positive. And that was an interesting presentation. So we showed some of the boring questions, and also we provided some suggestions how to replace them with some smarter options. In that presentation, we talked about TCP, we talked about some IGP ideas, we talked about, of course, BGP and uh, some really cool kind of innovative ideas to ask smarter questions. A little later, not like 85, Montreal, Canada, I presented another session, the anatomy of the most challenging interview question. The question back then was, okay, we had this survey and we talked to many interviewers and interviewees, let's find out what that most challenging question is. Turned out the question was, Type a URL, any URL you want in the browser, hit enter, and tell me what happens. Depending on the level of the candidate, how senior you are, how junior you are, there are so many different layers that a person could possibly see, and that's what made that uh, question so challenging. Some people would only see the routing part of it, some people would see the physical network as well, some people would focus on the systems engineering, see the DNS part and all those things. Some people would say, hey, you didn't talk about my system calls in my Linux box, I'm typing and I'm pinging, and um, how about security? All different layers. So turn out that was probably one of the most challenging questions, and again, based on feedback, all consolidated feedback here, people ask for a few things. Number one, show us some plan. Tell us, all right, I'm going to do this interview in two months or six months, let's say near future. How do I get ready for that interview? Or I'm the interviewer and I want to see what other people are doing out there. Also, show us some sample questions or sample scenarios. Real things that people do ask or kind of frequently ask for tech giant businesses. And that would be great to have some insider tips. And uh, I interviewed so far probably more than a thousand candidates in this field. Uh, I'd be more than happy to share as much as possible, but this session we have only 45 minutes. So let's get started and have a look at this presentation. So first of all, let's do some level set here, what this session is and is not about. This session is exactly what you see there, a bunch of clues or hints. We're not going to get any time to teach anything, but we will be focused on the main topics that people tend to cover. We will also make sure that we uh, kind of dig around and talk about how people uh, word their questions. At the same time, we will be sure that keep this session as an advanced session. So assumption is everyone here has some understanding of network engineering. This is not your very first time to enter the world of network engineering and you have some background. 
What this session is not, of course, it's not a training session. So we're not going to teach you how to configure OSPF. Assumption is someone sitting here, you know what BGP is or what it does. But other than that, I'm sure you will find this session very interesting. How the session is structured? Four main points. We will talk about people more likely to fail. And we will cover some key areas. Again, we pick three main areas. We're going to talk about TCP, UDP, and IP. We will pick an IGP and cover that as well. Also, we will talk about BGP. And uh, for each one of the sections, we're going to have multiple different tiers. So you will see junior level all the way to a principal level questions and reactions. Um, of course, this is a compressed version of a day, a full day interview. You're going to see a lot of keywords. You're going to hear a lot of uh, techniques. I'm sure this is going to be a pretty uh, heavy session, but please bear with me. The way I present the session, I tend to be very structured. I have introductions. I have separate chapters, and I will do recap at the end of these chapters. I'm not going to let um, you feel overwhelmed by the session. But three groups of people sitting here or listening to this session. One group is people in a room. We also have folks online receiving a virtual stream of this session. And the future folks are going to be watching this session on YouTube days, weeks, or years later. So if you are here, you don't need to memorize anything. Just take this as a quick quiz. Give yourself a couple of seconds. Think about your answers and how would you answer those questions. And later on, you will have access to the deck. So you don't have to take notes. If you are watching this session later on YouTube, all you can do is pause the session after each one of the slides, look at the slide, and quiz yourself. That's probably the best way to get the most out of this presentation. If you want to take photos, by all means. But again, you're going to have access not just to the deck itself, but you will have a YouTube recording of this session. So why people fail such interviews? This is something that I hear very often, that I did talk to four or five companies, fairly small to medium-sized businesses, great success. I got four offers. But then I talked to another company, one of the top 10 or top five IT businesses, and I got rejected. Four people tend to fail in interviews. Number one, people who do not take theories seriously. You like it or not, a big part of interview with tech giants is still focused on theories. Network engineers, we all like keyboards. We like our keyboards and marker. Let's design something and get down to configuration troubleshooting. This is usually not how those interviews go. The second thing is you do not have an understanding of their core values. Let's say you're coming from a very structured organization with uh, a change management process, for example. You put that change together. You do a peer review. You do L1 level, L1 review, level 2 review, level 3 review. And then it goes to a cab meeting. And then there's going to be a, some kind of timing assigned. And then you're going to be shadowed by someone. From that background, now you're interviewing with a company that believes in uh, fail fast. You have an idea. Talk to your boss, do the configuration, let's see what happens. Make sure you have a good understanding of that difference. Poor presentation skills, that's another one. Actually, that's a very interesting one. Presentation skill is not what I'm doing here. What I mean by that is, if you are interviewing for some position, specifically customer facing or maybe architect roles, don't be shy. Grab the marker, whiteboard, show your skills, ask questions, be interactive, as interactive as possible. And, uh, of course, the last group, people with no preparation. Many of us tend to believe, since it's our daily job, I don't need any kind of preparation. I'm just good. It happens a lot with things like PGP. And I will show you exactly uh, where things fall apart. So groups of people recently certified. Be careful. I know you just passed the test, but this is not going to be a configuration quiz. Long term in one job, if you've been in your existing job for more than 10 years, you might want to go back and have a look at the markets, technologies other folks are using, and uh, do a little bit of preparation. 
And personality types, that's an interesting point, the third one. You can keep in mind, maybe we could talk about that one for hours. You have one mission when you go there, and just one. Get in, get a job done, and get out. You're not there to teach anyone anything. You're not there to put anyone back in their place or anything. Nope. You're there to get an offer. So just focus on that mission and get that offer. And of course, the group of unprepared people. Today's session, we're going to cover TCP, UDP, and IP. We're going to talk about an IGP and BGP. However, we're not going to have time to talk about MPLS automation, cloud, and a bunch of other things. Uh, I will show you some references at the end of this presentation that if you want, if you're interested in those topics, we have had some really great sessions on those. But let's just look at some basics of TCP IP. There are two groups of people. When you look around and talk to engineers, especially the network folks, or two groups of people, folks with CS background, computer science or computer engineering background, or people who just started and come from another background. The CS folks usually know TCP IP in great details, like months, different semesters. So those folks are supposed to know there are different implementations of TCP. And they, they, they work I mean, and operate differently. But people who joined us at some point from other fields might not have the uh, best understanding of different implementations. To get us started, that's a really, really good point. Even if you use Wikipedia to have a look at different implementations, you will see the world is not exactly as classic as you think it is when it comes to TCP IP. Many cases, when you hear behavior of TCP, you might wonder, this is not exactly what I heard. For example, there is packet loss, and you're looking at a graph, and it goes further down. I was expecting it to go halfway down. These are all different implementations and behaviors of TCP. Keep in mind, people get PhDs in this field. So do some research. Make yourself familiar with different flavors. That was the basics. But let's look at, let's do some level set here. Uh, first of all, you need to know the theories. We talked about this multiple times. There might be some troubleshooting questions. They might show you some PCAP files and ask you to analyze those. And of course, you need to go beyond the three-way handshake. This is an interesting thing because when you talk to people, especially with smaller businesses, small to medium size, the farthest TCP interview you could go is, I'm going to ask you why you think TCP is reliable. And the answer is, why well, it does really handshake. And that's the end of that discussion. In this particular context, you're going to have to know a lot more. And be aware of the feedback. That's an interesting one. TCP is an area you don't want to fail. Just imagine great answers to BGP and MPLS and RGP questions. But when they get together and review the feedback, the feedback is, he did great, but he didn't know TCP. So tier one questions. These are the things I expect any junior engineer to be able to answer. Be 100% sure that you know the headers, inside outs, the fills, especially the flags. You're able to explain the details. The three-way handshake, you know the sims and act and act process. Make sure you also know what happens when the session, when the session tears down. Do you know the exact packets that were exchanged? TCP versus UDP is an interesting topic. If you go back to the Nanox 77 presentation, we talked about this there too. If you ask a junior level person, they're going to give you some classic examples. HTTP, of course, is TCP. Why? Because if something is lost, we can retransmit. We don't care. UDP, like voice. We can't afford waiting. So that's a great example. Make sure we come up with some other examples. Let's say you are designing a robotic system, a minesweeper for a defense contractor. The operator is a quarter mile away, and the device is working there. How would you design this? Would you choose TCP or UDP? Keep in mind the trade-off. You need to highlight the trade-off. The trade-off here is, do you want the session to be reliable? If something gets lost, you want to retransmit? Or you want to use UDP and send it once? You know what that means? It means if that device blows up for whatever reason, and you're using TCP, Right in the middle of a three-way handshake, your device might have already died. So you're not going to get even complete that process, that handshake process. However, with UDP, you could have sent a message during that time that your TCP was handshaking. But there are pros and cons. And uh, 
of course. 90% of candidates stop here. They don't even go beyond this point. Uh, you should. TCP slow start, classic versions of TCP. We talked about this so many times. There is lots of problem. We're going to slow down and ramp up again. Old days, we would set a timer, we would wait, and then do something about it. Let's say I send someone out to get some job done. I haven't heard from them. I'm going to wait one minute and do something else. Some newer implementations of TCP could do fast transmit. I'm going to call your name twice. When you hear that, you're going to respond to me. Explicit notification, something that some vendors might cover. I'm not really expecting junior candidates to know this. You proactively let me know what's going on on your side. And selective acknowledgment is another area that people tend to cover. What it means is, very selectively, you're going to let me know what you have received. So when I want to retransmit, I'm not going to start over. Third layer, when you get to this point, probably I'm looking at a very senior level candidate. What you see on this slide is uh, when there is trouble and you want to recover from that, and some examples in terms of PCAP analysis. There's a silly window, there's a silly window syndrome, meaning that window size on either size, so small that communication is not effective anymore, happens on the sender side. There is Nagel solution on the receiver side. David Clark provides a solution. People tend to ask these questions. Also, the scaling, window scaling option is another important topic that you need to know. The third one is an interesting one. Let's say you have fiber between North Pole and South Pole, and you want to transfer a file, and you have two different operating systems, or the same operating system, and your job is to optimize that process. This kind of scenario is not unlikely to show up. Just be prepared for that kind of scenario. The tool is extremely important. Ping, most candidates, maybe 50% can answer that, 60%. Details of ping, what's going on behind the scene, master types and all those things, but not trace route. I interviewed candidates and trust me, more than 90% of candidates, they cannot walk you through the details of trace route on different operating systems. It's not good. UDP based and ICMP based. So junior candidates would talk about TTL. We talk, we'd set TTL 1234 for hop 1234, and that's the end of the story. A little more senior candidates should be able to talk and explain. There are some messages we're getting back. More senior level candidate is going to tell you about the last hop. How does trace route know the last hop is reached? There, there has to be a way, right? You're not going to go uh, beyond TTL 255. What if the port you're trying to reach and you're probing, your trace route is using on that very last device is open, responding? Scenarios like this, create problems like this, capture packets and see what happens. This is kind of question I'm, I expect a, a senior level candidate to be able to answer. Let me recap the TCP section. Look at the headers, especially the flags. Make sure you know those. Look at different implementations and how they control different situations, including congestion of packet loss, enhancement, including selective ACK, and the tools. You probably know ping, and you need to know trace route. The easiest way to quiz yourself, imagine what if I had this stateless firewall between my source and destination, and I want to run these different tools. Do I know what kind of session, what kind of packet is going through? So that was about TCP's quick review of TCP. Hope takeaway that all of you have right now is the areas that you need to study and the amount of theories that we're talking about. Same applies to OSPF. OSPF is not really, uh, your OSPF interview is not really a configuration quiz. Very, very few people have seen the ask configuration examples. However, it's important to understand the particular use cases. Are you interviewing with a service provider or a large enterprise? The use cases are different. How do we find out? Look at the job descriptions. Their job descriptions, not necessarily your particular job description. If you're applying for company A and your job description just says OSPF, chances are, if you look at 10 other job descriptions, eventually you find some hints and you'll find out how they're using OSPF. That's why it's important to know the specific use cases. 
what we are going to talk about here, from you know version perspective, we will we will talk about IPv4 and some general topics. If you are interested in specific use cases, uh, back in the days in '19, I covered uh, uh, OSPF with IPv6 uh, in the backbone for some very specific use case. There is a link there. You can watch that session. And it has a lot of Super specific information, very, very specific use case. But today, we're going to keep this session as general as possible. Tier 1 questions. Well, for Tier 1, my favorite question of all time, right there, what is your favorite IGP? Well, you might answer, my favorite IGP is OSPF. Oh, keep in mind, I'm not asking about your, flavor, your favorite ice cream flavor. I'm asking, I mean, this question is very professional. You have to map that to what you did for your previous employer, existing employer. You got to give me some great examples. You got to go back and do a little bit of comparison too. Let's look at this and tell me you, what other options you had and why you picked OSPF. So the more you talk about different options and what you could have done, but you decided to choose OSPF, better. OSPF interface types, point-to-point -point and broadcast, and those things, everybody knows that. But the last one is an interesting one. Uh, this is one of my kind of favorite questions, too. Let's say you work for this company, and uh, you only, you're designing an OSPF network in only one area, right? You're not going to expand this. You're not going to have anything more, just one area. You configure area one, two, three, and your boss walks in, and now he's yelling at you. So what's the problem here? One area or area one, two, three? Well, nothing. Your boss is having anger management problem. With OSPF, you can absolutely have non-zero non areas if you only have one area. You're going to have problems later when you want to expand this, but there's nothing wrong with that area. That's absolutely possible. Trust me, good number of candidates, maybe majority of candidates, what, the way they answer this question is you must have area zero with OSPF. You don't have to, as long as you don't want to expand. Another tier one kind of question and area that people tend to cover is the router ID process. We all know about router ID, but think through this. What if something happens to the interface that you're using for router ID? What if someone mistakenly shuts it down? Let's say you're running a maintenance window, you're running a change management on a maintenance window, 2 a.m., backbone service provider, the code your automation is running, you put that together and you made a mistake. Instead of loop, loop back 001, you put in loop back 002, and that's a loop back you're using for router ID. What's going to happen? Those things are important. The last one is not really my favorite question, but people do ask that. Hey, what is the port number that OSPF uses? OSPF doesn't use uh, port numbers at all. OSPF has its own IP protocol number. 89, that's not a fair question, but one of the frequently asked questions. Another tier one topic, the DR election process. It is absolutely a junior level question. Many people can answer that, but the bullet points underneath that are interesting. Many vendors, and RFC as well, they do support priority and how priorities are set up. Come up with your own scenarios, the highest and the lowest. What makes you ineligible? How about taking the exact same concept of the world of ISIS and changing priority there? How would that change my network topology? So there are different ways to play with the DR election process. Let's make this a tier two question. Let's go and talk to a little more senior level candidate. DDR election process. So the candidates who answer the DR election process tend to fail that one. People know DR election. No one's to spend time to learn the backup DR election process. The second one is actually a fascinating question. And uh, this is something that I used to ask very often. That's why you consider always be at the quiet protocol. Percentage of people would say, what do you mean by quiet? Or this is not good because that tells me you don't have a lot of experience with other protocols, especially the noisy ones, the ones that used to flood a lot, and uh, you haven't done anything at crazy scale, thousands of devices. So it really matters. And you explain why OSPF is considered fairly quiet, what is not quiet, but what could be more 
or quieter than OSPF, for example, ISIS, and wider ways to tweak that. Here are three questions. This is for senior level candidates, but uh, depending on who you are talking to, you might be asked, even if you're being interviewed for a kind of junior level position. The state machine that OSPF goes through to form its neighborship is important, right? There are two different ways to ask this question. Some people ask you, tell me about the state machine. Well, that's, uh, you name it, and you give them a brief description. A little harder version of that question is, very specifically, actually Exastart is a favorite one. Let's talk about Exastart. Grab a marker, marker and tell me what happened during the Exastart process. There's a good reason for that. Exastart and Exchange are two interesting troubleshooting scenarios as well. Be 100% sure you know them inside out. Best way, capture packets. Configure your OSPF network, shut down interfaces, bring up routers, and see what happens during these stages. Or look at your log files and see how your device goes through that negotiation and synchronization process. And of course, average candidate stops here, but you don't want to be average candidates. Let's look at some more. Implicit versus explicit process in OSPF. This is a keyword that I want you to go back and just dig around and learn a little more if you do not know exactly what it is. I moved to this new neighborhood. I introduced myself to my neighbor, and next day when I'm going to work, he's walking his dog. He sees me and says, hi, how you doing, Cam? How are you doing, Cam? That's implicit. What that means is that sentence tells me he knows my name. What if he says, you must be Cam? That's explicit. The same process exists when you work with the OSPF. Good analogy, just make sure you know that process. I was asked, as a candidate, that second question, one, not one of my favorite, but it does happen. What if your router receives two, or more than two, of the same LSA? There is, a, there is a process to choose that and to pick one based on highest sequence number, highest checksum, and uh, LSA aging. Do some research, I'm sure you can find a lot more in this. The convergence process for OSPF is another area that people do ask questions. So the convergence process has multiple different stages. You start from detection, and then you go through the entire convergence until every single table is stable. And it's not just the OSPF, BGP, MPLS, everything has a convergence process. In the case of detecting that problem, if you have enough experience with OSPF, if you were as old as probably I am, you will remember days the only option we had was to you know, play around with our timers. Later, the vendors had the ability to create, uh, to actually tweak those timers, multiple timers, multiple helots per second, and then BFD came out. BFD is an important topic. Many interviewers for senior level positions ask BFD questions. We had a great presentation back in 2009. It's an old session. I think Tom Scholl presented that in 2009. You can go back to that really cool presentation. I think it was Nanak 45. Uh, it's the basis of BFD. On top of that, you can just go back to your favorite vendor and learn more about BFD and why we are separating that messaging process from software and taking it to hardware layer. Again, another tier three question. All junior level candidates should be able to explain virtual uh, links. It's an easy topic. But what if the area, the transit area you want to run your VLs do, for whatever reason, does not support uh, virtual links? Might be you're using some IoT, devices that do not support virtual links at all. You might have some restrictions in terms of LSAs. So how about GRE tunnels? Can I replace my VLs with GRE tunnels? That is a possibility. When you want to show that architecture to an interviewer, please go beyond just the partition area zero. Everybody knows that story. Look at that one. Once upon a time, a junior engineer designs an OSPF network with one area zero here, another area zero here, and there's an area 100 in between. Well, fire this guy. But there are really good scenarios, real world scenarios, where some kind of, for example, fiber cuts 
could lead to a situation like that. And that's where you find yourself in and you're troubleshooting a network where now your area zero is partitioned. So the area zero is not always partitioned by design, it might be as a result of an outage. In those cases, you want to have the virtual link or GRE tunnel in place. Those are kind of architectures that a senior little person must be very comfortable with. The LSA types, question I ask all the time. The favorite types are three, four, and five, three, four, five, and seven. I've been doing this for 25 years and I've seen LSA type six three times. So you can safely assume 20, LSA type six, don't worry about it. However, type four is important. Let's talk about type four for a second. We have three, four doors here. The address of these doors could be communicated to me in LSA type four. So I know how to get out of this room. That's what LSA type four does for you. LSA type four is not gonna tell me anything beyond that door. I'm not gonna find out who is sitting out there. That's somebody else's job. But LSA type four is specifically show me where these doors are. Architecture level questions for stub and totally stubby and SSA areas. It's good to know the basics, to be familiar with those, but you need to have some real world use cases. Be sure you come up with your own scenarios. For example, you're designing a network for this a university and they have mm, towers, large buildings. If you do not need every single route for each one of these floors and you have core switches or aggregation layer switches on each one of the floors, you might want to try totally stubby. Just give them a default gateway. The floor is going to be fine. All they need to know how to get out of the floor. Real world scenarios like this. And uh, this, is in, this is a very important slide. So if you want to memorize one slide before your senior level job interview, OSPF, that's a slide. When we talk about external routes in OSPF, we have E1 and E2 routes. Again, let's go back to our analogy. We have multiple different doors here with E1. I care about different paths to get to those doors. That door is 50 bucks, $55, and 150 bucks, right? There are different doors, different pricing. But with E1, I do care which path I take because that one is more expensive than this one. E2, I don't care. There is N1 and N2. And in, in the context of OSPF, you're going to have intra-area and inter-area routes. Each one of these, they also have an order of preference. Which one is preferred when you receive both? These are questions that people do ask. Please make sure you're 100% comfortable. OSPF, the border layer, is going to exhibit uh, DV or distance vector behavior. What it means is OSPF does some kind of topology abstraction. This is not rat summarization. I'm talking about topology abstraction. If you are in this area, you're not going to find the details of the other area. That's where OSPF is showing distance vector, distance vector behavior. Do not be surprised if someone asks that question. And with NSSA, when you receive routes from outside, LSA type 7 comes in, right? There is an ABR here to the other room. As soon as the updates hit this ABR to go to the other room, the translation happens from seven to five. There is one door here, one translation point. What if I end up having multiple different rooms? A higher strider ID takes over and does the translation. But what if I want to do traffic engineering with that? These are advanced OSPF questions. Let's recap what we talked about. We talked about the state machine. We talked about different types of routes and preferences and different kinds of LSAs. Make sure you're 100% comfortable with those before you walk into any OSPF job interview. And take a look at the RFC as well. The OSPF RFC 2328 is, uh, is actually really cool. There's been some updates to that, but that RFC covers many things. Last but not least, BGP. So a problem with BGP, all of us, is this. We do this every day, but what we do is mostly repeat our designs, and some of us uh, we do configuration and uh, maybe some troubleshooting. Very, very few people do BGP brand new design every day for two or three new customers. Uh, so you need to go back and look at the theories uh, again. We talked about this slide and I put a link there. So anytime you want to go back to the previous presentation and see the boring BGP questions, there is a link there. But let's get started with the basics. We're going to talk about IPv4. 
And we're going to focus on classic PHP. We're not going to get into vendor-related details. It's going to be a lot, but I'm sure you can find out more. Tier one stuff. Let's say you call my cell phone. It's 9 PM, and you have a job interview tomorrow. Your question is this. Look, I only have a few hours left. Tell me something about BGP that uh, the interviewer might ask tomorrow. That's a slide I'm going to show you. These are the questions highly likely you're going to get. They're going to ask you some attributes questions and inbound and outbound traffic engineering for tier one junior level questions. Very, very fair. A little more advanced, you need to know the messaging system and the BGP state machine as well. There is a point up there, and I want to highlight that. Once actually someone asked me that question, it kind of surprised me. We were talking about decision-making process of BGP, all the different steps, all the 12, 13, 14 steps, depending on different things. And he said, okay, what is a step zero? Well, if you're using, let's say, Cisco as your vendor, you start to wait, but what is a step zero? This is the weird way that some people call this step zero from their perspective is, is next hop reachable. So if next hop is reachable or is not reachable, that could basically trash the entire decision making process. I don't use that terminology, but I heard that before. Tier two, a little more interesting. Make sure you're very comfortable with AS path beyond just the basics. Look at the components, AS set, AS sequence especially when it comes to something like aggregation, it's very important to know what you're losing and how atomic aggregate and aggregator together show you what happened behind the scene. Uh, and of course, you're not gonna see, most cases, the, the ASNs, all ASNs that were part of the AS path, depending on the vendors though. So be careful that you are, you need to be 100% comfortable with that terminology. And, of course, the last point is kind of one of my, one of my favorite topics. A nitty-gritty of different types, for example, optional, non-transitive. Many candidates, it's interesting, they know this is going to come up, but they're not comfortable. They cannot clearly explain the difference. The MED is one of those things. I will tell you why the MED is so important out of all the BGP attributes. Here is a very, very basic example. I mean, this is, it can't be simpler than this. The green part, the green cloud, is your upstream network. Could be the internet or enterprise number two. There's huge difference between the two. There's a reason you see both of them here. And of course, the blue one is where you're sitting. And the question is, come up with four different architectures, and I want you to prefer one circuit over another for inbound traffic. Well, junior level candidates, let's look at the solutions. Junior level candidate knows this one. I'm going to send longer AS path out of one, problem solved. That's good. That's definitely possible, one of the options. Second thing is, I'm going to advertise more specific routes. All right, that's actually a really good one. Why not? Possible. Depending on the limitations upstream, but that could be one option. I want to use BGP communities to flag, to signal my upstream. That's possible. But that's pretty much the end, of, the end of knowledge when you talk to junior level candidates. Now let's look at some senior level answers. Do not advertise at all. Wow, if I don't advertise and circuit A goes down, I'm gonna be in trouble, right? We didn't ask you to design a redundant network. That's fine. Oh yeah, that was not part of the requirements. So kind of tricky question, but it's possible. Don't advertise it. If you don't want traffic to come through that circuit, do not advertise it. The fifth one is an interesting one. The MED, M-A-D. Why yes, why no? So optional non-transitive. Non-transitive meaning, I get it, I'm not gonna pass it on. With the enterprise design, if we were to go back to this scenario, just the blue, just the green part, enterprise, the MED would actually work. You could do that, and you don't have to worry about anything. With the internet traffic, that's not necessarily the case. So be a little careful what you're doing. But if you're choosing the MED over longer AS path, there are some consequences. Senior level candidate is expected to know those differences. And this one might actually completely go away. How to scale BGP architectures? Two main ways, there are other ways, but two main ways for this particular context. 
BG per rash reflectors and configurations. When candidates want to talk about rash reflectors, very few people know how we got there. That's interesting. Everybody says, well, we didn't want to have full mesh, so we decided to do rash reflectors. Why would you need full mesh? It's a fair question, right? Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to a point where at some point in the past, the tables were so small, we could actually export, redistribute different terminology, routes back and forth. It would not have a problem. The problem started when the tables started getting bigger, and we ended up turning that synchronization option off. And that was when we promised we're going to do full mesh. And that we kept our promise until it became impossible. And then we said, OK, we're not going to do full mesh. We're going to do something else. Let's implement something called rat reflectors. Another interesting question that people ask is the traffic flow in rat reflectors, how the traffic goes from one point to another. This is a tricky question. Different RFCs recommend different uh, uh, traffic flows, and different vendors implement different solutions. So be careful. Just to give you one example, you are one of the spokes, one of the clients of a RAS reflector, and you advertise something to the RAS reflector hop. Are you going to get the same update back or not? It depends. So there is no yes or no answer. Think through scenarios like this. And the case of redundancy and cluster ID is another interesting one. Which one do you want to do? Do you want to achieve high redundancy? Or you want to preserve your resources? With different router IDs, you're going to have all different redundant paths. But with same cluster ID, you're going to have different paths. With the same cluster ID, you're not going to have all the paths. That's one of the interesting things to keep in mind when you're designing for scale. And uh, the best route selection process, traditionally, router ID always advertise the, the best route. There are ways to change this at Path and many other solutions out there. Loop rev and in the context of MPLS, there are other solutions too, because now you have uh, something else attached to your addresses. Loop prevention is a good topic to talk about in the context of uh, BGP. And it becomes very interesting when it comes to rash reflectors. You have original originator ID and your cluster ID. So very fair questions. Confederations. These are the bullet points I can share with you, but it's pretty simple. Probably the most important one is you should be able to compare and contrast the two rash reflectors and confederations. Let's say more than 10, probably 12 different uh, cases that you can compare the two. And of course, you can design configurations with rash reflectors and different use cases of each. There are some special topics. Very few people ask this these days, but it's possible, and I've seen them. What if you want to take into account your IGP metric as well? We have AIGP attributes. You want to use BGP as a carrier to carry your link states? Topology, possible to do BGPLS. BMP for BGP monitoring. DDoS prevention using flow spec. Know the story here. The story is, at some point in the past, we had other solutions. For example, we had black holing techniques. The flow spec, you could do a lot of that. And it does work. We have a really good presentation, more than one. I think two or three different presentations, NANOC presentation on flow spec. Resource considerations, how to design for scale at the same time, preserve memory and CPU. And uh, pick and BGP in data centers. The last one is interesting. There is an RFC. That's not the only way. That's an informational RFC. That's not the only way to design BGP in data centers, but that's definitely one of the possible ways that people tend to ask questions. We talked about are our house router, how route reflectors advertise the best route, simple route reflector using outpath or MPLS backbone as you, uh, as you add uh, attack to your addresses. It's good to do a little bit of research on internet exchanges and know how they work, what they are. The last one is an interesting one. If you have a candidate and the candidate claims he's a BGP expert with internet connectivity and all those things, you might want to ask just one question. The size of BGP tables, IPv4 and IPv6, if the candidate knows I'm plus minus 50,000, 
this person probably has worked with BGP recently or BGP scale or internet table? That's a good question to ask. I sometimes ask that question, but usually have some follow-up questions as well. But be sure the night before the interview, have a look at the BGP table. It's good to know that, and it's not good to be off by 200,000. Little recap on what we talked about. We covered the state, we talked about the importance of a state machine, different attributes, traffic engineering, different way to answer that question. Listen to the requirements very carefully. The fact that the route, there's one circuit, completely goes out of a picture, doesn't mean your option is bad. That's one of the possible ways to solve that problem. You might want to highlight it to the interviewer, but keep that option in your back pocket. Understand the internet architecture, how the internet works, how different ASs are connected to each other and how traffic uh, flows. And we talked about the modern topics as well. What is left is, I, I would love to talk about the MPLS backbone, BGP data centers, optimization, all those things. Might be some future sessions, but I'm sure if you do some research, you will find really good presentations that people did in the past uh, here at Nanoc. And you could use this deck as your checklist the night before the interview, week before the interview, be sure that you know all these topics. I think I covered a really good percentage of topics that people ask when you interview with tech giant uh, businesses. One example is today, for example, we talked about LSA Type 4. Dig around. You know LSA Type 4. You know where it is. You know what the originator is, what the scope is, and the function is. The question is, how do we minimize the number of LSA 4s? So, uh, go a little beyond just these keywords. And uh, if you score 85 at the end of this presentation, you're 100% prepared to take any job interview and be successful. And these are the rest of resources I used, and I strongly recommend you go back and have a look at those as well. Thank you so much for paying attention. And this was the, I think, last session. So thank you so much. All right, we're going to have two, right? Two more sessions. But thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy this. I know I talk a little fast, but do not worry. You're going to have the deck, and this session is recorded. You can always watch this later on YouTube. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much. No, thank you. Absolutely.